Hi, welcome to the cancer and immunology session of the, the mouse genetics component of, of this conference. My name's Viva Howell and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers talking about different aspects of cancer as well as tuberculosis today. And um, I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Tyler Jacks, who's the Professor of Biology at uh, MIT and the Director of the Koch um, Institute. Welcome. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation to be here. So I'm going to spend my time talking to you about uh, some aspects of the work ongoing in my lab, applying various methods to modify uh, genomes of cells to model various aspects of cancer. Um, by way of introduction, I think we all realize that cancer cells arise from normal cells through acquisition of mutations in two broad classes of genes, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Um, but we also know that cancer is more complex. It involves interactions with many cells of the host. Um, these can be endothelial cells, fibroblasts, cells of the immune system, and others, which contribute both positively and negatively to tumor development. In addition, cancer cells often don't stay where they start. They move in the process of metastasis, and this, this too involves lots of interactions with cells of the host. And therefore, cancer is not just a disease of cells, it's a disease, a disease of tissues, a disease of organisms. And for that reason, many years ago, we and many people in the room decided to uh, model this disease in vivo, and the uh, organism of choice for us was the mouse, based on the ability to make specific mutations in genes of interest. And once those mice are in hand, um, one can do lots of interesting experiments related to disease progression, but also methods to detect the disease at earlier stages, to treat it more effectively, uh, or to prevent its arrival in the first place. Now, this situation has become more complex over time, uh, and that's due to the fact that we now appreciate there are many, many, literally hundreds of genes that are mutated in the formation of human cancers. This is one example from a study of non-small cell lung cancer led by Matthew Meyerson uh, and the TCGA, which shows that there are 17 frequently or statistically significantly mutated genes in human lung cancer. Um, and you'll note from this slide that really no two individuals are the same. Each person has a different constellation of mutations. Some genes are mutated at high frequency, like KRAS and P53, which we'll focus on in today's presentation, others at low frequency. But literally every patient is unique. So there's tremendous intertumoral heterogeneity. And to make matters worse, we also know from the work of Bert Vogelstein's group and Charlie Swanton's group and now many other groups that there's tremendous intra tumoral heterogeneity. That is to say, the genotype of a tumor in one sector of the tumor is likely different from a different sector of the tumor, and literally two cells sitting side by side may have a different, different constellation of mutations. And this makes the job of mouse modelers like us much more challenging. And the reason is that if one uses traditional methods to functionally validate every one of those genes that is mutated in human cancer using uh, germline models of cancer, it will take a very long time. And this just shows an example using the KP mouse model that we use in my lab, and I'll describe in more detail in a moment. If you had an interest in a gene, gene A, and you wanted to test its consequences in the model, <clears throat> you'd have to make or acquire a mouse mutation in gene A and then cross it into the cancer-prone strain. That would take a while. Then you'd grow up those mice. That would take a while. And then you'd do the tumor studies. That would take a while. And in total, it would take you a couple of years and some hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that would be for one gene. Um, given that there are hundreds of genes that we're interested in, this is a very daunting uh, prospect. And so we in my lab, and I think many others in the field, uh, began to get somewhat depressed about this situation. The clouds ahead were darkening, uh, and we were in despair. And under the circumstances, we looked skyward, uh, and fortunately, the skies opened and delivered, <laughs> delivered unto us was CRISPR. And it was good. <laughs> so CRISPR, as you know, uh, is an ancient system of bacterial immunity. And fortunately, thanks to the work of Jennifer Doudner and Manuel Charpentier and others, we now have a simplified version of this system composed of just an enzyme and a guide RNA that can bring the enzyme and endonuclease, endonuclease, endonuclease to a site in the DNA where it will cut, make a double-strand break at that site. And then depending on the repair process, one can get non-homologous end joining occurring, which is often an error-prone process leading to insertion and deletion mutations, 
loss of function mutations, or if you apply uh, or introduce a homology donor at the same time, one can incorporate those mutations directly into the genome at that site. And this technology, of course, has taken over the field, cancer and otherwise. There are now 5,000 papers or more published using this technology just over the last couple of years. And it's been used in a whole wide range of applications, modifying cell lines, modifying the germ line, uh, doing screens of various sorts, modifications of the system to turn genes on and to turn genes off. We decided to ask the question whether the system could be used to modify genes directly in vivo rather than having to make those mutations in the germline and breed them in. Could we skip the germline step? And this work was initiated in my lab by Wen Zhu in a paper that was published now a couple of years ago. And we decided to take the simplest system we could think of first, and that was to introduce the CRISPR components by a hydrodynamic gene transfer, just injecting them in PBS, plasmids encoding Cas9 and a guide RNA <clears throat> into the tail vein of a mouse, allow those DNAs to go to the liver where they would get taken up at reasonable frequency, and ask, could we mutate genes directly in the liver in this fashion? And the answer was that we could. Here's an example of inactivating the P10 tumor suppressor gene in this context, and you can see that indeed you can create P10 deficient cells uh, in the livers of these mice by direct mutation using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. If you add plasmids that encode two different guide RNAs against P10 and P53, you can actually get cancer in these mice. And these tumors carry biallelic mutations in the two different, P, uh, two different tumor suppressor genes. So the system works incredibly well, actually. And in just a few months, you can generate a model of, of uh, liver cancer in otherwise wild-type animals. Um, in addition, you can do gain-of-function mutations this way. You can introduce, uh, add a homology donor at the same time, and in this case, convert beta-catenin from its normal state to an oncogenic state by direct mutation in the hepatocytes. Given the success in the liver using this system, we went on to test uh, whether we could make this work in the lung, and Thales Papianakopoulos in my lab and Francisco Sanchez Rivera developed a vector to introduce Cree, Cas9 and a guide RNA all at once, and use this, to use this in a model of lung cancer that we created and have studied in many different contexts. I'll talk more about this. It's a model in which we activate KRAS and inactivate P53 in a Cree-dependent fashion. And in this case, we're going to add a vector that also has Cas9 and a guide RNA against a gene of interest. And it could be any gene of interest. Here are three different tumor suppressor genes that we studied in the first case. And the question is, can we inactivate these genes directly in these developing tumors? And that, does that change the tumor phenotype? And the answer is yes. In all three cases, we were able to increase tumor burden uh, and increase tumor grade by inactivation of these additional tumor suppressor genes, that we could do functional validation um, very, very rapidly. Um, we could study the consequences of mutation of these genes at the genetic level and observe oftentimes two predominant loss of function mutations. Sometimes the situation was more complex uh, where we'd find multiple alleles. And this isn't very surprising because the enzyme is going to be active in different cells at different times, and you might therefore get different mutations. With these loss of function mutations that are selected for in the de development of tumor genesis, it's very common, therefore, to get uh, tumors which have complete loss of function. And in this way, we could functionally validate actually many, many genes in a fraction of the time and a, and a, and a fraction of the cost. Um, since the published work, we've gone on to functionally validate four more genes on the list that I showed you previously, and we're basically working our way through. And again, this is happening at a much accelerated pace compared to what we've done previously. Um, I wanted to mention that we are not the only ones who are using this technology in this setting. There are actually quite a few published and unpublished studies that are looking at the use of CRISPR-Cas9 technology for in vivo modification in the context of mouse models. I won't spend a lot of time summarizing all that's on this slide, but just know that for many other tissues, perhaps all tissues that you can think of, this technology exists. Where you can deliver the CRISPR components, you can get inactivation certainly, and in some instances activation as well, um, using this technology. Okay, now I want to turn my attention to two scientific stories that are um, as yet unpublished in the lab, and uh, these illustrate the utilization of the kinds of mouse models that we've created. 
um, and they'll touch on, at least in one case, um, Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So here's the KP mouse that I described previously. Again, it has a KRAS activating mutation, P53 inactivating mutation. These are both Cree inducible events. So the addition of Cree on the back of a lentivirus allows tumor initiation, and these tumors over time will progress, including in some, uh, in some mice to metastasis. And the disease looks quite like the human disease as well histopathologically. So we think it's a good model genetically of the disease. There are common mutations in the disease as well as histopathologically. Now the fact that we use lentiviruses to induce the tumors is relevant because we can also build, as you saw in the Cas9 example, other functionalities in these lentiviruses. We can bring other stuff into these developing tumors. So you can put your favorite gene under your favorite promoter. And your favorite gene could be a cDNA like Cas9, but it could be a microRNA. It could be an shRNA. It could be a guide RNA, as you've seen. And so in this way, we can modify the genomes of the developing cancer cells uh, in a very powerful fashion. So I want to give you some examples of how we've done that. And the first example I'll give you is to explore this question of tumor heterogeneity. How do the tumors change over time from their initiation, where everything's uniform, the cells have mutations in KRAS, mutations in P53, to an advanced tumor that looks like this, where there's clear heterogeneity? Not every cell looks the same one next to the other. And based on what I told you before, you might imagine that that represents genetic heterogeneity, that the cells have acquired different somatic mutations in other relevant genes. But interestingly, that's not true. Um, we've sequenced the genomes of these cancers, and we find very few acquired somatic mutations, on average about 10 to 12, and relatively few um, 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 recurrent mutations. So it doesn't look like there's a lot of genetic heterogeneity that acqui is acquired as these tumors progress. There is epigenetic heterogeneity. The cells are changing transcriptionally, and indeed there are very interesting changes as the cells progress from normalcy to malignancy to metastasis. So this is happening, and we think it probably is the driver of the kinds of heterogeneity that we're observing in the model. The first story I want to tell you relates to a study involving what I'm calling here cell state heterogeneity, and specifically whether in the evolution of these tumors, whether cells acquire cancer stem cell or stem-like cell fates. And this is a work of a current postdoctoral fellow by the name of Tuomas Tamala, who specifically asked the question, might the Wnt signaling pathway be activated as these tumors develop in, in, in an example of a stem-like cell process. The Wnt signaling pathway is frequently affected in human cancers, most notably in colon cancer, but in others as well. Normally the pathway is inactive through the turnover of beta-catenin in its cytoplasmic form uh, through a destruction complex that involves the APC tumor suppressor gene. When the pathway is engaged by Wnt ligands, the destruction complex itself is inhibited. Beta-catenin is stabilized. It goes to the nucleus where it turns on the expression of target genes that are involved in stem cell behavior as well as proliferation. And I'll note one particular target, LGR5, because it comes up later in the talk. LGRs are actually receptors themselves that are, cooperate with the Wnt pathway for reinforcing Wnt signaling. So the Wnt pathway is important in cancer. It's very important in stem cell biology as well. Again, most notably in the gut, but in many other tissues as well. The Wnt pathway is important in stem cell biology. So Tuomas first asked the question, might the pathway be important in this model system? And he asked that question by looking for evidence of Wnt pathway activation through nuclear beta-catenin as the tumors developed. And so he first stained advanced tumors with beta-catenin antibodies, and he found that there were indeed scattered cells that were beta-catenin positive. That's an indication that in those cells the pathway is in fact on. He then went on to use this strategy of com combining different elements within the initiating lentiviral vector. And here he used a reporter that's driven by the Wnt pathway, the so-called 7-TCF reporter, driving luciferase. In this case, you can mark cells that are responding to Wnt because they will glow. And indeed, you can see as tumors develop, uh, shown here, uh, that we see positive uh, luciferase activity. An even more powerful demonstration is to use GFP, driven by the same 7-TCF promoter, and you can see in developing tumors that we have green cells. Now, not every cell is green, not every cell has the Wnt pathway on, but select cells do. And this, again, would be consistent with the emergence of a subpopulation of cells that have turned on the Wnt signaling pathway. 
He also looked for that marker LGR5 and by in situ hybridization could demonstrate LGR5 positive cells. Again, rare LGR5 positive cells. Now that was important to us because Hans Klaver's lab had made a mouse which marked LGR5 positive cells through a knock-in of GFP into the LGR5 locus. And by crossing that allele into the KP model, allowing tumors to develop, one can isolate LGR5 positive cells, which Tuomas did, and he found that indeed, again, these were rare, a rare subpopulation of cells within the tumor, here about 5% in a more advanced tumor. Now, if these rare cells had more stem-like characteristics, we should be able to demonstrate that by functional assays, which Tuomas tried, both in vitro and in vivo. In vitro, he plated these cells in three-dimensional uh, conditions to look for their colony forming ability or sphere forming ability. And indeed he found that the LGR5 positive cells were much more capable of forming so-called tumor spheres. And you can see by, by EDU staining that these cells were also much more proliferative compared to the LGR5 negative cells, consistent with them having stem-like features. He also transplanted these cells in vivo and he found that the LGR5 positive cells were much more successful in making transplant tumors. So again, suggesting that they have increased tumor initiating potential, which is again uh, consistent at least with their stem-like features. Now in the normal, um, uh, in normal stem cell biology, say in the gut, the Wnt responding cells receive their Wnt from other cells, niche cells that supply the Wnt in trans. And the best example of this is in the colon, where uh, stem cells in the crypt receive their Wnt signal from panath cells that sit right next door. And these panath cells produce the Wnt's and actually modify the Wnt's through an enzyme called porcupine. This leads to a palmitylation of the Wnt's that is necessary for its secretion. So these niche cells are marked by the expression of porcupine. And so Tuomas asked the question, are there porcupine positive cells within these tumors as well? Is that how the Wnt pathway is being stimulated? And indeed, when he stained these tumors, these tumors in which he could mark the Wnt responsive cells with LGR5 with porcupine, he found that indeed there were Wnt pathway positive cells in green, but also porcupine positive cells in red. And if you look closely, you could see juxtaposition of Wnt pathway positive cells and porcupine positive cells. This looks like the tumor is establishing its own niche, um, which is quite remarkable actually. Now where those niche cells are coming from is an interesting question. They could migrate into the tumor. Maybe these are macrophages that migrate into the tumor and provide the wince to the rent responsive cells. Or maybe it's other tumor cells that turn on the porcupine pathway, turn on this Wnt secretion program, and that's feeding the uh, stem cell population. Now we could ask that question genetically. And the way we did that was to use the CRISPR-Cas9 system and target porcupine in the developing tumor. If the niche cells were tumor cells, inactivating porcupine in those cells should inhibit tumor formation or at least tumor development. If the porcupine was coming from infiltrating cells, such inactivation would cause no effect. And so Tuomas targeted porcupine using the PSEC system uh, and what he found was, strikingly, in contrast to controls, which make big tumors, as shown here, when you target porcupine, you get smaller tumors, significantly smaller tumors. Interestingly, tumor number is not significantly affected. The same number of tumors initiate, but in the absence of porcupine, they cannot expand to the same extent, as though you need to develop this niche stem cell program in order to promote tumor progression. Now I tell you this in part because this has therapeutic implications. If you need this program in lung cancers, in mice, and ideally in humans, you could probably target it for therapeutic benefit. And it turns out that Novartis has made a porcupine inhibitor called LGK974. And we've now used this inhibitor to see whether we can block tumor formation in our animals. We initially did this in the transplant setting by taking the LGR5 positive cells, or actually whole tumor cells in this case, and transplanting them into recipient mice, and then treating those recipient mice with LGK. And you can see that when you do that, you significantly inhibit uh, tumor formation. Uh, and that's quantified here. So in this transplant setting, inhibiting the Wnt pathway clearly has effect. More convincingly, I think, when you do this in the in vivo, uh, in the autochthonous setting, in the KP model, once again, the addition of LGK significantly slows 
tumor formation. That can also be seen by micro CT imaging here. Here's the control setting where the lungs fill up with tumor. And here's LGK treated animals where the lungs are, have significantly reduced tumor burden. And this leads to an expansion of lifespan as well with LGK as a single agent and in fact in combination with other agents has even more dramatic effects. So I think in summary these data suggest that there are in fact uh, wind pathway positive cells as well as niche positive cells in this tumor. We've also demonstrated that they exist in human non-small cell lung cancer and we believe therefore that this pathway may be an important target uh, in the treatment of human lung cancers and we're encouraging our pharmaceutical partners to explore that more directly. Okay, let me now finish up in five minutes uh, by talking about another story which relates to immunosurveillance and happens that this is a theme of today's meeting. So indeed we are um, interested both in natural tumor progression and all, also how the immune system sees tumors in these model systems. And our entree into this work was made some years ago when Michael Dupage asked the question, does the immune system actually see these tumors at all? If you just look in the KP mouse as the tumors evolve, does the immune system see it? And the answer is actually no. We see very few infiltrating cells in these, in these models. Now initially we were confused by that result, but now we think we understand it. And the reason I've already told you, these tumors don't acquire many, very many mutations. They have very few things for the immune system to see. There are very few neoantigens for the immune system to see. So given that result, Michael Depage decided to ask the question, what if we provide antigens to these tumors for the immune system to see? And the way that he did that was once again to use this bifunctional antiviral approach, Cree plus. In this case, it's plus luciferase that has been linked to strong T cell antigens the OVA antigen, the 2C antigen, come along with CRE and get expressed at the time of tumor initiation. And in this case, when you do that, as summarized in a paper that Michael published some years ago and in follow-up work carried out by Nick Joshi, now we can observe a strong immune response. We can see T cell infiltration into these tumors, especially at the early stages. In the 8 to 12 week time point, we see many, many T cells responding to these tumors. They're infiltrating into these tumors and they're seeing these specific antigens that we've programmed into the tumors. This has effect. The antigen expressing tumors evolve less well. They are smaller at the early stages. But you'll notice at the advanced stages, antigen expressing tumors catch up and actually kill the mice with the exact same kinetics. And the reason that's true is that the immune response dies away. After about 20 weeks of effective immune response to the tumor, T cells become exhausted. The number of cells is reduced and the, tumor, and the cells get excluded from the tumor proper and sort of hang out at the edges of the tumor. Nick Joshi has actually looked into that process quite extensively. The cells actually accumulate in these tertiary lymphoid structures that sit right next door to the tumor. These are very interesting structures that Nick is going to be carrying out studies on in his own laboratory at Yale shortly. Um, and in addition, those structures contain inhibitory cells called regulatory T cells. And they seem to inhibit the function of these tumor reactive T cells. And I say that because if you eliminate those T regs in these established tumors where you see a very reduced immune response and the T cells are hanging out here at the edges, if you get rid of Tregs by depletion of these cells, you see a massive infiltration of, uh, of uh, T cells into the tumor and tumor ablation. So in this respect, we can show that Tregs are an important regulatory factor in controlling immune responses in cancer. And we think that's important too because the field has been looking for some time for ways to enhance T cell based therapies like checkpoint therapies. And the assumption is that if we can add things to, for example, checkpoint therapies, we can augment their responses and see better responses in a higher percentage of patients. Treg manipulation <clears throat> might be one way to do that. And finally, I'll just mention that uh, Leah Schmidt in my lab has been exploring another cell type within the immune system, named, namely natural killer cells, to see whether they too can be recruited to activate either directly anti-tumor immune responses or to augment T cell based immune responses. Natural killer cells respond to target cells like tumor cells through the expression of ligands like stress ligands. In addition, they have inhibitory receptors that interact, for example, with MHC class 1. When activated, NK cells directly kill their targets. 
and they also support broader immune responses by secreting cytokines. What Leah decided to, to do was to express a specific NK ligand from MCMV called M157 in a DOCS-dependent fashion within our tumor system, the KP tumor model, to try to recruit more NK cells to the tumor. And in this experiment, again, using a bifunctional antiviral vector, which now contains M157 in a DOCS-dependent fashion, crossing, uh, initiating tumors in which you can induce the expression of these NK ligands, what Leah found was a dramatic increase in the number of NK cells within these tumors. Uh, and that can be visualized immunohistochemically. Here are a series of controls where the NK cells are not infiltrating the tumor. But when you induce the expression of M157, you see a significant increase of NK cells, and importantly, a significant increase in infiltrating B cells and T cells as well. And so this is a way to directly augment immune responses. Uh, this has been done in a couple of different ways. But importantly, we, uh, although we observe this effect of cytokine secretion and B and T cell recruitment, um, we actually do not see much in the way of NK cell killing or T cell mediated killing in this context. Um, and, and this was surprising to us at the first case, but in fact, given that these tumors don't naturally express antigens, maybe it's not surprising that the T cells don't have anything to do once they get into the tumor. And so you might be able to anticipate where we're going next, and that is to combine um, the NK activating ligands with antigens for the immune system to see. So this is a tri-functional vector. And indeed, Leah has compared the efficacy of just the expression of T-cell antigens or the combination of T-cell antigens plus NK ligands. And what she finds is that in contrast to T-cell antigens, which still allow for the development of significant tumors, when she combines that with the expression of the NK ligands, tumor size and tumor number is significantly inhibited. And so we think, therefore, that NK cells, too, might be able to function as a way to boost uh, anti-tumor T cell responses, and we think this, too, has therapeutic implications. So I'll stop there and thank the folks who've done the work. Um, the initial work on uh, uh, wind signaling was carried out by Thomas Tamala in the lab, and the further work on T cells, mostly Nick Joshi, Michael Dupage, and the NK work, uh, Leah Schmidt, with a series of collaborators shown here. Thanks very much. Thank you for a, for a great talk. Um, do, we have any, do we have any questions? So, so it was striking that the um, porcupine and the LGR5 cells are sort of sitting right next to each other. Um, and we know that you can get self-organization in tumors from teratomas. Do you think this is a more general feature? Yeah. Uh, we don't know, but I think that it's highly likely that the uh, LGR5 positive cells are inducing the uh, porcupine positive cells or vice versa. And most likely the same is happening developmentally. Um, we haven't begun to explore that detail as yet, but I think that's exactly what's happening here. It's not unlike the development of notch ligand expressing and responding cells in other aspects of development. Do you, do you think or do you know if Cree or Cas9 are behaving as neoantigens in any context? Yeah. So we have no evidence that, that Cree functions as a strong neoantigen. In fact, the experiments that I showed you in which there's no, not much immune response in the KP model, Cree is expressed there. So I don't think Cree is. Cas9 is a different story. Um, we have some evidence that Cas9 can be immunogenic, and others, including Yas Yonkers, has very good evidence that Cas9 can be immunogenic. So if you're thinking about using Cas9 in a vector, know that you might be inducing an immune response. Now, there are germline Cas9s now, and those might be a better way to have Cas9 in the system without inducing an immune response. So you're introducing neoantigens, but um, in people, KRAS mutated lung cancer is generally is often related to smoking. Have you, have you added that to your yeah. system? Yeah. We actually have not added smoking, per se. Others have tried to do that, and it could work. Um, it's very clear that if you increase the mutational load, 
you can induce an immune response. And chemical mutagenesis is certainly one way to do that. It hasn't been done with smoking in our model, but it's done by others. It has been done by others. And in the chemically induced tumors, you've seen many, many more mutations. We're starting to do that actually now by using CRISPR to inactivate mismatch repair genes and other repair genes to increase the mutational load and ask, is there a greater immune response? We'll see. Uh, well, I've got the floor. Just one more question. So very generally, uh, in mouse, when we're doing mouse models of cancer, we often get sarcoma rather than, <coughs> yeah. than epithelial carcinomas. Can you comment on, on that? Yeah, we do too. And depending on exactly the route of administration, for example, if you're using viral approaches, if you're going through mesenchymal tissue and therefore hitting mesenchymal cells, you may well get sarcomas. I think they're highly sensitive cells to certain particular mutations and RAS and P53 are among them. So we run into that problem as well. I think the way around it is, depending on, again, the route of administration of virus, to be able to do that in a fashion where you do not hit mesenchymal tissues or to use transgenic crees and maybe ERs so that you can do directly within the epithelial cells. Okay, please um, thank again Tyler Jacks for a fantastic